Well, it's a pleasure to uh, be in the Lord's house with you all tonight. Uh, And if you have your Bibles, would you turn to 2 Timothy uh, chapter 3 and verse 16 with me? 2 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 16. Tonight, uh, as we finish up our study that we've been doing uh, on the Roman Catholic Church, uh, I just want us to go through all that we've looked at up to this point and kind of summarize uh, a lot of that material that we've looked at. And uh, I just want us to look through uh, four areas that we've broadly looked at together, and I'd like us to uh, just remind ourselves uh, of what the, the Catholic Church teaches about those things and what the scripture uh, teaches about those things. And so if you have your Bibles in 2 Timothy chapter 3, we'll begin reading in verse 16 together. The scripture says, All scripture is given by inspiration of God, and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, truly furnished unto all good works. I charge thee, therefore, before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall judge the quick and the dead, his appearing and his coming, preach the word, be instant in season, out of season, reprove, rebuke, exhort with all longsuffering and doctrine. For the time will come when they will not uh, endure sound doctrine, but after their own lusts shall they heap to themselves uh, teachers having itching ears. And they shall turn away their ears from the truth and shall be turned unto fables. And now let's go to our Lord in prayer. Father God, we come before you, and Lord, we thank you for uh, the faith that's been delivered to us, the faith that's found in your word and in Jesus Christ, Lord. And we pray as we come before your throne that by Jesus Christ you would hear us. Uh, Lord, give us uh, hearts to understand what your word says tonight. Uh, Lord, give us uh, by it the uh, things that we need, the equipment that we need to go and uh, preach the gospel uh, to those in our lives that are in the Roman Catholic Church. Uh, Lord, we pray that they would be made ready by the Spirit to hear us and that they would come and trust in Jesus Christ. Uh, Lord, we ask that where we've sinned against you, that you'd forgive us by him. And Lord, that you'd be with our missionaries where they are to help them to proclaim him to the nations, uh, to have enough for uh, the tasks that you've delivered to them. Lord, be with our leaders and help them to uh, turn to your Son. Uh, Lord, help them to see all that they have in him and all the prosperity of this land can be found in him, Lord. And we pray that you'd help them to uh, surrender their ministry uh, into his hands. Uh, Lord, we again ask that where we've sinned against you, that you'd forgive us and that you'd keep us safe and uh, be with those that couldn't be here with us tonight and bring us all to the day of Christ. And it's in your Son's holy name we pray. Amen. So, tonight looking in, uh, again, the uh, teachings of the Roman Catholic Church, uh, as I said, I'd like us to look at four areas that we've already covered and uh, just see exactly how the church has gone wrong, and we'll uh, try to go through these briefly. First, we've seen that the Roman Church has gone wrong with how it believes about Scripture. The question of what scripture is, is one of the foundational problems between uh, the Roman church and the church of Christ. Uh, The Roman church sees scripture as one source of special revelation among many, not as the infallible word of God. Again, in the uh, statement entitled De Verbum, uh, Pope John Paul, uh, uh, Paul the, uh, the sixth uh, wrote that sacred tradition and sacred scripture form one sacred deposit of the word of God committed to the church, not just scripture, but also sacred tradition, that the traditions of the church, the way that the church has done things in the past and taught things in the past, uh, and if it stands long in the church and is developed within the church, then that is taken as being as authoritative as Scripture. And in the Catholic Catechism, it also adds that the magisterium of the church 
is another authority, that is the teaching offices of the church, the teaching structures. In section 85 of the Catholic Catechism, the task of giving an authentic interpretation of the Word of God, whether in its written form or in the form of tradition, has been entrusted to the living teaching office of the church alone. Its authority in this matter is executed in the name of Jesus Christ. This means the task of interpretation has been entrusted to the bishops in communion with the successor of Peter, the bishop of Rome. And it also says all that it possesses for belief as being divinely revealed is drawn from this single deposit of faith. So the source of of teaching, of divine revelation, is both scripture and sacred tradition, and the magisterium, the teaching office of the church, is the only infallible rule for uh, interpreting these two uh, sources of revelation, and and particularly the bishop of Rome. Uh, The uh, pope is, is over the teaching offices of the church, and he interprets them and teaches on them infallibly in certain circumstances. And so the question is, is Scripture just one uh, uh, source of special revelation among many, or is it the uh, only infallible rule for the church? As we read before in 2 Timothy 3.16, all Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, truly furnished unto all good works. First, it says the Scripture is the, uh, the only thing mentioned in Scripture as being given by inspiration of God, as being given for us and, and able to fully equip us to uh, every good work. And you'll notice that as it equips the church to every good work, it should inform how the church does things and even supersedes tradition. If, if the, the scripture is perfect, if it is entire to, to inform the church on how it should uh, teach, how it should conduct itself, then tradition uh, is not sufficient. It's, it's not a sure foundation. Uh, the scripture alone is fully uh, sufficient to equip us to every good work. In chapter 4, verse 1, I charge thee therefore before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall judge the quick and the dead at his appearing and his coming, preach the word. Be instant in season, out of season. Reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. He says, preach the word. What is that word? The scripture that he just spoke about. To preach that, to use that as the rule of the church. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but after their own lust shall they heap to themselves teachers, having itching ears. And they shall turn away their ears from the truth, and shall be turned unto fables. They will turn away from this scripture. They will turn away from it as the only infallible rule. They will heap these other teachers to themselves because of their itching ears, because of what they would like to hear, and will be turned to uh, turned to fables, turned to untruths. In 2 Peter 1, verse 20, Knowing this first, that no prophecy of the Scripture is of any private interpretation. For the prophecy came not in old time by the will of man, but holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. It is of no private interpretation. It's not the private interpretation of the Bishop of Rome. The Scripture did not come by his uh, willing, his activity, and so it's uh, not by his activity to uh, be the only rule about it. Uh, it, it he, he does not stand over the scripture to interpret it. Rather, he, the, the scripture ought to interpret him and ought to, to, to inform how we uh, see what he does. This is also beside how the scripture teaches that the Spirit of God helps the believers, not just the teaching offices of the church, but the entire church. He helps all of the church in community, in fellowship with one another, uh, to, to understand what the Scripture says. Uh, in John 14, 25, These things have I spoken unto you, being yet present with you. 
But the Comforter, which is the Holy Ghost, whom the Father will send in my name, he shall teach you all things and bring all things to your remembrance, whatsoever I have said unto you. Uh, He teaches truth. He brings to remembrance. And uh, so he, uh, there's no need for a a bishop of Rome. There's no need for a, a top dog in the church to teach everyone under him and to impose his own interpretations down on everyone. Rather, we walk by the faith of the Spirit of God We read the scriptures, we are taught by the scriptures, and together we come to what the scriptures tell us. And so what the scripture is for Rome is, again, it's one source of revelation among many, but for what it said, the scripture itself teaches, is that it is the sole infallible rule of the church, because it is authenticated by the Spirit of God, it is taught by the Spirit of God, it is written down through the activity of the Spirit of God in history, and so only it is, uh, is the rule of faith for us. And so the second topic I'd like us to revisit is what is the church in Romanism? In Romanism, it is a dispensary of saving grace. In the Catholic Catechism, section 845, to reunite all his children scattered and led astray by sin, the Father willed to call the whole of humanity together into his Son's church. The church is the place where humanity must, be re- must rediscover its unity and salvation. The church is the whole reconciled, uh, the, the, the world reconciled. She is the bark which in the full sail of the Lord's cross by the breath of the Holy Spirit navigates safely in this world. According to another image, dear to the church fathers, she is prefigured by Noah's ark, which alone saves from the flood. Outside the church, there is no salvation. So the church is... uh, a means of saving grace. Right there it even says that it is the church which saves. Being in the church, that that, that coming to the church, the church is what will save you. In section 846 of the same, it says, how are we to understand this affirmation? Often repeated by the church fathers. Reformulated positively, it means that all salvation comes from Christ, the head, through the church, which is his body. So the salvation of men comes through the church. The church has a a, a role in cooperating with God's saving grace in order to save the world. And thus, uh, membership and participation in the church is necessary to be saved under Catholicism. And that, of course, we looked at through the sacraments. They give out saving grace by the uh, works that they give people to do, uh, whether it be by baptism or by the Lord's table or by penance or whatever, uh, that they give saving grace in this way. And so is the church a means of saving grace or is the church simply a fellowship of the saints in worshiping God and a means of sanctifying grace, not of saving grace, not of forgiving grace, The church does not forgive you. The church is the forgiven. The church is the one that needs salvation. It's not the Savior. In Acts 11, verse 15, Peter speaking said, As I began to speak, the Holy Ghost fell on them, as on us at the beginning. Then remembered I the word of the Lord, how that he said, John indeed baptized with water, but ye shall be baptized with the Holy Ghost. For as much then as God gave them the like gift as he did unto us, who believed on the Lord Jesus Christ, what was I that I could withstand God? When they heard these things, they held their peace and glorified God, saying, Then hath God also to the Gentiles granted repentance unto life. When Peter recalled going to Cornelius' house, he said, Who was I? Who was St. Peter? that he should withstand God, who was saving. God was the one who sent the Holy Ghost. God was the one who gave the forgiveness of sins. God was the one who drew to his own self, and it was only to Peter 
to receive what the Lord had done, that God had saved them, and so to administer them baptism. It was not that Peter gave them saving grace. The the supposed first pope of the church, uh, even he said, who was I that I could withstand God? What did he have to do with the salvation of these people? It was a work of God. The church is not to act as a savior, but rather to build up the saints. Ephesians 4.11 says he gave some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some pastors and teachers. And what was the purpose? For the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ, till we all come in the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect man, unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. It was not given, the, 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 the apostles, prophets, pastors, teachers, they were not given uh, as the Savior again, but they were given because God was saving, and so to minister to those who were saved for the perfecting of the saints who already were. And so the Catholic Church says that the church is a means of saving grace, but the scripture says that the church itself is the one being saved, is the one in need of saving grace. And so the church coming to Christ receives salvation from him, not from the church, not from the assembly of sinners made perfect. And so next we ask, who is Christ in Catholicism? Christ, the one that we worship, Christ, the one who is, uh, who is above all things, Christ for whom we are named Christian, who is he? In Catholicism, he is one mediator among many. He is not the only mediator. He is one among many under Catholicism. In the Catechism, it says in section 1477, this treasury includes as well the prayers and good works of the Blessed Virgin Mary. They are truly immense, unfathomable, unfathomable, and even pristine in their value before God. In the treasury, too, are the prayers and good works of all the saints, all those who have followed in the footsteps of Christ the Lord, and by his grace have made their lives holy and carried out the mission of the Father entrusted to them. In this way, they attained their own salvation and at the same time cooperated in saving their brothers in the unity of the mystical body. So Mary and the saints, they cooperated, they had a role to play in the salvation of their brothers and sisters under Catholicism, the saints that are now on the earth. In section 962, it goes further and it says, This motherhood of Mary in the order of grace continues uninterrupted from the consent which she loyally gave at the Annunciation and which she sustained without wavering beneath the cross until the eternal fulfillment of all the elect taken up Uh, Taken up to heaven, she did not lay aside this saving office, but by her manifold intercession continues to bring us the gifts of eternal salvation. Therefore, the blessed virgin is invoked in the church under the titles of advocate, helper, benefactress, and mediatrix, a mediator, a uh, a, under biblical understandings of that term, uh, what what it means to be a mediator. that she is uh, a savior, for, that, that, that she mediates before God on behalf of those who are being saved. And so the uh, role of Christ in Catholicism uh, is not that he is the sole mediator, is not that he is the sole uh, person cooperating in the salvation of humanity, but that he is one among many intercessors. He is, in fact, one among many saviors. But the scripture says that Christ is the only mediator and is the only savior of his people. 1 Timothy 2 verse 5 says, for there is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus, who gave himself a ransom for all to be testified in due time. And Hebrews 4.12 says, Seeing then that we have a great high priest that has passed into the heavens, Jesus the Son of God, let us hold fast our profession. 
For we have not an high priest which cannot be touched by the feeling of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted like as we are, yet without sin. Let us therefore come boldly into the throne of grace, that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. He is the only mediator, and he is the only one that we need come to for saving grace. Let us come boldly before the, the throne of grace to, to the uh, high priest that has been touched with the feeling of our infirmities, that was tempted in every point, like as we are yet without sin. The only mediator that we need is Christ, and the only mediator that exists. In 2 Corinthians 5.21, For he hath made him to be sin for us, who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. Uh, as we looked in the course of uh, our studies of Catholicism, we saw also that the righteousness of the saints, the good works of the saints are counted towards uh, sinners, uh, that, that they are part of the righteousness that is given to penitent sinners. But the scripture knows no such thing as this. The only righteousness is the righteousness of God that's given to us by faith. And so while he is counted as one among many intercessors, one among many mediators, the scripture says he is the only mediator. He is the only intercessor, the only savior of mankind. And so with that, how are we forgiven under Catholicism? Under Catholicism, again, it is by not only the righteousness of Christ, but also by our own efforts and the efforts of the saints in cooperating with God's grace. The Council of Trent uh, says in section 15, uh, If anyone saith that a man who is born again and justified is bound of faith to believe that he is assuredly in the number of the predestinate, let him be anathema. And in section 24, for uh, if anyone saith that the justice received is not uh, preserved and also increased before God through good works, but that the said works are merely the fruits and signs of justification obtained, but not a cause of the increase thereof, let him be anathema. And the justice there is talking about justification, the righteousness that's given to us. Uh, that if any man say that that justice, that righteousness uh, is uh, not increased by good works or maintained by good works, then it says, let him be accursed, let him be anathema. And so they say that our salvation is by works, by meriting the grace of God given to us. But the scripture says the salvation is by faith alone, by simple trust in Jesus Christ. Romans 4 verse 4 says, Now to him that worketh is the reward not reckoned of grace, but of debt. But to him that worketh not, but believeth on him that justifieth the ungodly, his faith is counted for righteousness. Even as David also describeth the blessedness of the man, unto whom God imputeth righteousness without works, saying, Blessed are they whose iniquities are forgiven, and whose sins are covered. Blessed is the man to whom the Lord will not impute sin. If it were by works, then it would be by debt. It would be what's owed to us. But because it is by faith, because it is by not working for it, therefore it is counted for righteousness, and it's gracious on God's part. Only by faith in Christ are we saved. Titus 3, 4 says, After that the kindness and love of God our Savior toward man appeared, not by works of righteousness which we have done, but according to his mercy he saved us, by the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Ghost, which he shed on us abundantly through Jesus Christ our Savior. Not by works of righteousness, not by anything that we had done, but according to his mercy he saved us. And how is that? By pouring out the Holy Ghost towards us. By pouring out His Holy Ghost, by sending His Holy Ghost to convict our hearts, to bring us to life in Christ, and then cause us to look to Him in faith in Christ and to receive the forgiveness of our sins. That's how we're saved. 
not by what we've done, not by our own merit, not because we were better, but because God was good to us to give us Jesus Christ as a Savior. And so tonight, uh, we've been somewhat brief, but nonetheless, I think we've uh, come to a nice close in our study of Catholicism here. And I'd like us to go back to the passage that we looked at at the beginning of tonight in Titus chapter 3. And I'd just like us to see what we should do in taking, uh, what we should take away from this and what we should do with what we've learned in the past few weeks. In Titus, uh, 2 Timothy 3, verse 16, we read, All Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, truly furnished to all good works. What we've been doing throughout this study is we've been looking at what the Catholics believe, looking at what they say, but then applying the Scripture to what the official Catholic Church teaching is and seeing uh, what errors are in that church. And the scripture says that as we've done this, as we've looked at these things, the scripture has been equipping us. The scripture has been, has been making us perfect to every good work. And here it's been making us perfect to the work of talking to those that we know, of being good ministers of the gospel of Jesus Christ towards them. And so in verse uh, 1 of chapter 4, I charge thee therefore before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall judge the quick and the dead at his appearing and his coming, preach the word, be instant in season, out of season, reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. We're charged to preach what we've heard, to, to, to bring it to those that we know. We're to uh, be instant at any time, in season or out of season, to talk to them about the things that we've looked at, to reprove them, that is to, to show them where their church is wrong, where they have uh, associated themselves with error in it, to rebuke them for that, uh, to, to tell them that they have sinned against God in doing such, to exhort them, that is to, to call them to the right way, to call them to what the scripture says that they ought to do, to trust in Jesus Christ if they have not, or to come out from among them and be ye separate, saith the Lord, and to do so with all long suffering and doctrine. That is, as we've looked in the scripture, to, to, to be patient with them and to bring them to the material that we've looked at in the last few weeks. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but after their own lusts shall they heed to themselves teachers having itching ears. And they shall turn away their ears from the truth and shall be turned unto fables. But watch thou in all things, endure afflictions, do the work of an evangelist, make full proof of thy ministry. And believers, I pray that we would make full proof of our ministry that we've been given towards them. Do the work of an evangelist, call them to the gospel of Jesus Christ and to the right way of walking before him. And now if there's an unbeliever here uh, tonight or uh, listening to the recording, uh, I would just like to call you to trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. You've sinned against him. The scripture says that all have sinned and come short of the glory of God, that the wages of sin is death, eternal separation from the goodness of God, eternal presence of his wrath against you. But the scripture says that the Lord Jesus Christ can be your salvation, that the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. And as we read earlier, that this comes to us not because of what we've done, not because we have attended the right congregation or because we've uh, done the right things in our own lives, but in Romans 4 verse 4, to him that worketh is the reward not reckoned of grace, but of debt. But to him that worketh not, but believeth on him that justifieth the ungodly, his faith is counted for righteousness. And so if you will have that faith in Jesus Christ, then you will have it counted to you, his righteousness counted to you for righteousness. And so I pray that you would trust in him before it's too late. And believers, let's take what we've learned and uh, put it into use uh, in our own lives as God gives us 
opportunity to do so. And let's go to our Lord in prayer. Father God, we come before you, and Lord, we thank you for the surety of the gospel that you've given to us. Lord, that we can lean fully on Christ and have life in him. Lord, we pray that you would help us to take the knowledge of that life, Lord, that power that's in his blood to those that we know, Lord. We pray that if we have any that are in our families or among our friends that are in that church, Lord, the Roman church, Lord, that you would help us to speak to them boldly. Lord, help us to overcome skittishness about talking about religion. And Lord, we pray that uh, you would open their hearts to receive the gospel and they'd be saved. Lord, again, we pray for those that are not with us tonight, to, that you would keep them safe. Uh, Lord, that you would give them uh, give them help and comfort in their troubles. And uh, Lord, we pray that you would bring us all back together to worship before you again. And it's in Jesus Christ's holy name we pray. Amen.